do you still hold the position that the only way you could become a believer is by saying the Shahada and becoming a Muslim? Or can someone be a believer with basically, like you said, following the righteous path and uh, following God alone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's a tricky question because when you say a believer, um, mm -hmm. it, fall it naturally follows to say like a believer in what? Right. Like you can believe that there's a, uh, you know, a green monkey on the moon. Mm. <laughs> right. And then you'd be like, OK, how do I how do I get to that? Right. I, I think that we need to remember that when they say Muslim, it, they're talking more in regards to one who has submitted their will to God rather than this modern day term of, oh, I've said the Shahada. So now I'm a Muslim because they weren't these people who just claim to be a particular religion they were people who claimed that they've submitted their will to god mm -hmm. yeah that that would um that would hold true if the so like for example there's a timeline right mm -hmm. so the shahada at the time of abraham was la ilaha illallah ibrahim rasulullah right the, and, and the islam of abraham is going to be uh relevant to the times of abraham I, like I believe that the a majority of the misinterpretation happened at the beginning when uh, the Quran was uh, compiled and all the other Aruf were pretty much destroyed and uh, it was kept in one dialect which was probably the easiest to manipulate. Uh, one of the key things being, for example, is the Kaaba. The Kaaba isn't really mentioned in the bio, uh, in the Quran. So what they would do is they would invite two witnesses, two witnesses that heard and saw the Prophet ﷺ receive the revelation to vet the verse that came. And they did that for every section, every verse of the Quran, right? When they compiled it, they compiled it without diacritical marks. <laughs> what that compiling allowed to do was see the various different ahruf and from those various different ahruf you can see that people can make their own qiraat because there's no diacritical marks which is the fatha kasra dhamma the thing that you see that would in provide enunciations mm -hmm. okay now after they compiled that uthman radiallahu anhu ordered the mushafs of the people that had their own personal notes to be burned in order so that there is no confusion whatsoever. What's happening, man? How you been? Very good. How about yourself? It's been a little while. Yeah, you know, Ramadan, fasting, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Got to stay on top of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I've been trying to catch you uh, on this, but you've always been doing like, from where I am, really early streams. Oh, okay. So uh managed to get the day off. So I was like, you know what? Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> As I think you guys would say, Alhamdulillah, if God wills. Alhamdulillah. That's what that means, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if it happens, it happens. So yeah, today's the day. Um really so enjoyed that last mind? bit there. Sorry? What's on your mind? I don't know. Uh nothing normally. <laughs> I uh, just thought uh, it would be a good chance to have a chat about Islam, about anything you want, really. Um, I know that last time we were having a conversation, we had three other people on, and the conversation kept getting diverted to what I believe, rather than just a normal chat about how we could be better people. Yeah, for sure, man. Um, you know, the so uh, it's it's always tough when there's more than one on a panel. Mm -hmm. And I prefer one on one chats. Um, now, interestingly enough, you know, we have that so that we have a, a solid amount of knowledge exchange uh, between like the various participants that come up. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I fall short on anything, I have someone there that has a, a different degree of knowledge that can maybe expand upon certain things. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to your question, though, on how we can be better people, right? You know, just reflecting on the reading of, of the Quran, um, there's so many 
concepts that keep getting reinforced, right? Um, and you're welcome to tune into the to the readings. I, I started this series on it, but you'll see concepts of justice, forgiveness, righteousness, um, charity, uh, preservation, like of chastity, of honor. Mm. Uh, you'll see courage. Uh, and then you'll also see the opposite of that stuff being used as an example. And now from uh, our position, right, like the Islamic position, uh, we really believe that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't change the condition of a person until they change themselves. Mm -hmm. so we feel that these things are consequential, right? Like um, everybody has the same opportunity to come upon belief if they were just to approach it sincerely and conduct these actions uh, that would be categorically under uh, the category of righteousness and avoid the actions that categorically fall under, you know, uh, disbelief, right? Which is everything from like arrogance, uh, disobedience, lying, mm -hmm. stealing, cheating, um, immorality, and so on and so on and so on. So the way that we see it, uh, you know, back to kind of bring it back to your question of how do you come back to being a good person, right? Is, uh, if you want good, then you have to visit the source of good, right? Mm -hmm. And that source of good is Allah. And he tells you that if you want me to reform you, you have to begin by reforming yourself. And the way that you reform yourself is to follow these principles that I deem good because I'm the source of good. And then naturally, um, I'm going to be softening your heart and shifting up your situation so that you can be upon belief, mm -hmm. right? Um, and upon good, yeah. right? So that's, that's our position. So um, I don't know, since you've started reading the Quran again, do you still hold the position? Oh, maybe you never did. Let, let's define if you ever held a position. And if you did, do you still hold the position that the only way you could become a believer is by saying the Shahada and becoming a Muslim? Or can someone be a believer with basically, like you said, following the righteous path and uh, following God alone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's a tricky question because when you say a believer, um, mm -hmm. it, fall it naturally follows to say like a believer in what, right? Like you can believe that there's a, uh, you know, a green monkey on the moon, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And then you'd be like, okay, how do I, how do I get to that, right? In regards to a believer in the ultimate reality in the believer of the the ultimate truth right and in the believer of the one deity worthy of worship then that would file under islam because the islamic position is if islam is true everything else is false right speak everything else is a deviation the only thing in the quran it says the only thing that's accepted by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the deen of islam which means submission because of the root word is Islam. So like if you are submitting to that deity, meaning you're following the guidance that he has laid down mm -hmm. and you're fighting your inner self, such as like your personal desires and societal desires and so on and so forth, then you are actually mm -hmm. committing the things to uh, submit to that deity, right? So like, the reason why I'd say it's tricky is because when you're talking to a Muslim, uh, they understand, or at least they should understand, that there's multiple beliefs out there. But the hmm. only one that's going to be accepted is Islam. Yeah, so it's not just about the beliefs, because like you just said, it's the act of submission that is accepted. It's not just about beliefs. Like you said, anyone could believe that there's a green monkey in the moon. doesn't mean that you're going to be saved. So I, this is where I am at, at the moment. I'm trying to get Muslims to understand that just because someone doesn't believe in Muhammad or whatever doesn't mean that they're not submitting their will to God. It just means, and because they haven't said the Shahada, doesn't mean that they haven't submitted their will to God. It just means that they don't follow that particular book because there's wisdom in every book. Um, I'm sure you guys use the reference of Jesus being a Muslim because he lay down and prayed on his face and he fasted and these are all taken from the bible like it's like oh the bible's okay to use as a source when it proves something positive for islam but anytime else there's wisdom in there you're like no it's 
all wrong because the only thing that's true is Islam. So I think that there's wisdom everywhere where we could gain an understanding that submission is the key, but I don't think it's necessarily just from Islam. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things to unpack there. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing is in regards to when you said submission, right? And where, what is the actual path to God, right? So for example, when you say there's wisdom in all books and you're submitting mm -hmm. to all books, um, then you no, can't... No, no, not submitting to the books, submitting to God. Okay. So let's say you're, you're trying to submit to God, right? Mm -hmm. But only one of the books is claiming that it's from God, right? Okay. So now if that book is claiming that it's from God, you have to do your due diligence to actually vet that it is indeed from God, mm -hmm. right? And if that book is claiming that because this is the only one from God and all other ones were either corrupted or impacted in some way by, by human beings, and there's a deviation now from God, then you have to follow what's true. So, and you have to submit to what's true, right? So that's the first thing. The second thing is in regards to uh, what you said for Jesus, we don't follow Jesus uh, in a sense, and we don't say that Jesus is a Muslim because of the Bible. We say that Jesus, Isa Alayhi Salam, is a Muslim because he's, he's mentioned in the Quran to be a Muslim. So we don't actually use the Bible as a criteria for, for vetting our belief at all, mm. right? If you turn into uh, chapter 19, you have Surah Maryam, it goes into who Isa alayhi salam was, like mm -hmm. his miraculous birth, how he talked in the cradle, and then how he admits that he is a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Mm -hmm. And he says that I'm a Muslim, right? So now uh, on the same token, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, if you go to um, Surah Al-Anbiya, which is the prophets, uh, it's he specifically lists Solomon, he specifically lists um, Jesus, Moses, mm -hmm. Noah, Muhammad, Aesop, Islam. He specifically lists uh, Lot, uh, Job, uh, Job. Uh, he's David. He so and and then he Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says all of these were Muslim. So we're using the Quran as the criteria to determine what was actually said. But again, none of this thing is going to drink water with you if you don't believe that the Quran is from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Right. I, I, I think that we need to remember that when they say Muslim, it, they're talking more in regards to one who has submitted their will to God rather than this modern day term of, oh, I've said the Shahada, so now I'm a Muslim, because they weren't these people who just claimed to be a particular religion. They were people who claimed that they've submitted their will to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that would um, that would hold true if the so like for example there's a timeline right mm -hmm. so the shahada at the time of abraham was la ilaha illallah ibrahim rasulullah right the, and, and the islam of abraham is going to be uh relevant to the times of abraham and mm -hmm. the, the islam of solomon and the shahada of solomon was la ilaha illallah sulaiman rasulullah right mm -hmm. so that was a, now what you're seeing today is the Islam of Muhammad. So because Muhammad, we believe him to be the seal of the prophets, right? Uh, going forward until the day of judgment, the Shahada is going to be La ilaha illallah Muhammad and Rasulullah, right? So if you if you were to contextualize it and look at it from uh, their respective time frames, right? They all delivered the same message, which is the pure monotheism, which is that submission that you're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Now, how they submitted, so for example, the times of Abraham, they could have had a different set of laws or rules or a different sharia, mm -hmm. right? And then now, uh, when it went to uh, Isa, when it went to, uh, when it went to Moses, when it went to Jesus, when it went to all these other prophets, they had a different sharia, mm -hmm. right? So like, let's say, for example, during the times of Isa alayhi salam, it's possible that they fasted for 40 days instead of 30. Mm -hmm. right? It's possible that um, they had restrictions on what they could and couldn't eat uh, apart from what we had. Mm -hmm. Right. We just simply don't know because and, and it's not pertinent for us because we are living in the times of Muhammad. Alayhi salam, so we are under his laws, which is obviously God's law. 
Mm -hmm. And we have dietary restrictions. We have, uh, likewise, we have um, recommendations and we have obligations for charity, like 2.5% for zakat. This is all in the law, right? And part of our law, part of our Sharia is to believe in the previous prophets, mm -hmm. right? So like I can see an instance where, let's say, uh, the times of Isa alayhi salam, his Sharia was to believe in the previous prophets, but because the forthcoming prophet Muhammad alayhi salam wasn't there, it wasn't obligatory for you to 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 believe in what's you know, you know, mm -hmm. not there, right? So now, it, if you look at it from like a timeline's point of view, it makes sense, and they submitted to that deity which sent down the commandments or sent down that law. And the law was how you would properly submit to him. So, for example, if you were to say, you know, I cracked open the Quran, I see that there's times of prayer, and now I have to know how to pray, right? Naturally, you're going to go to the Prophet, and you're going to say, hey, how did he conduct his prayer? How did he submit to this deity? And what did he teach us, right? Because we mm -hmm. believe both the Quran as well as the authentic hadith are revelation. So mm -hmm. if he prayed five times a day, if he made ablution a particular way so you can purify yourself, and then he decreed that this is the way that you submit to that deity, now you have a um, sort of like a blueprint and you have a roadmap on how you can go about submitting and being in that state of submission. But that's only if you believe him, if you believe the message and so on. So uh, I don't disagree that there's tons of wisdom out there, but the challenge that you're gonna have is if you think that you can come up to a Muslim and you can say, hey, you can go about connecting to God in different ways, uh, he's going to say, or he should say, if he is educated enough, uh, the only way that you can connect to him is the way that he prescribed. And what he prescribed was in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Does that yeah, make but, sense? yeah, but what if it's been corrupted? Yeah, then you'd have to explore wh wh where, where in the Quran or what do you feel that it's, where is the corruption? Uh, it's in the interpretation of the Quran. The interpretation of the Quran is causing uh, a lot of people to do fitna because they think that they are superior to other people. They think that, oh, we are the believers, everyone else is the disbelievers, only we will be saved and we have to force everyone to believe the same thing we do, otherwise they're going to hell and we're killing these people or allowing them to convert for the sake, their sake, not our sake. And it's and it, it, it sounds like it's been corrupted in regards to certain other things as well. Um, I could go into more detail, but I don't want this to be a debate. <laughs> I just want no, to. Just, I, I have a dialogue with people. So, I mean, if it's stuff to clear up doubts that'll be mm. beneficial for anybody and everybody that's listening, as well mm. as for the future, then I say let's explore it, right? Yeah. So, like, for example, if you say that there's corruption in interpretation, mm -hmm. right? You're familiar that the Quran does talk about sex. Right. Yeah. And you're familiar that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does tell us to hold tight to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not to cause deviation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So he forewarns us that this is going to happen. Now, he also tells us that um, this is not a form of corruption as far as rev revelatory corruption, but rather it's a corruption of man who is twisting an interpretation, just like you said. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now now there's a process that you can take in order to vet as to what's true and what's not, right? So you have Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, right? You have the practices of the Prophet, and then you have the general consensus of, of, of the majority, mm -hmm. right? So when they go and they take a consensus, you have to follow proper scholarship in order to get rulings. Now, what you're seeing is, let's say, for example, circumstances of... Um, I mean, take what's relevantly going on today, right? You have a bunch of people getting blown up, okay? Mm -hmm. Families are getting tossed out apart. And now you have uh, verses in the Quran that talk about war, that talk about this, that talk about that, where people can go on like recruitment sprees. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And they can easily uh, twist the verses in order to attain whatever their goal is. Mm -hmm. right? Okay, so now with respect to that, okay, that person is going to be held accountable for what he is doing. Mm -hmm. But the fundamentals, the fundamental creed of Islam, as well as the entirety of the revelation is still preserved. Rather, what you're seeing is the effects of some crazy person or some scholar for dollar, right? 
who is twisting the word in order to have a goal that is apart from what Islam is, right? And you have that across like all scriptures. So it's not the actual scripture per se in the Quran that's corrupted because the revelation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he's going to preserve it. And he's going to be the guardian over it, right? But when it comes to interpretation, it's the person's responsibility to vet whether or not this is true or not. So if they're hearing something and it doesn't quite sound right, then they have to go through the proper channels to get a sound understanding of what it is that's not sounding right. So if you have an example of something like, let's say, that doesn't sound right, then mm -hmm. you and I can explore it together. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, so I, I, like, I believe that the a majority of the misinterpretation happened at the beginning when uh, the Quran was uh, compiled and all the other Aruf were pretty much destroyed. And uh, it was kept in one dialect, which was probably the easiest to manipulate. Uh, one of the key things being, for example, is the Kaaba. The Kaaba isn't really mentioned in the bio, uh, in the Quran in regards to it existing or being a part of the prayer. Uh, what it does reference is the Al-Masjid Al-Haram. Now, if we look at in a historical essence, the Masjid Al-Haram is, according to Muslims, the building around the Kaaba. Um, the mosque around the Kaaba. Um, if you have a look online, you can find out that it was actually built after Muhammad had died. So when there's a reference in the Quran in regards to Muhammad left al-Masjid al-Haram, uh, this is, I think, the journey that he took to heaven. Uh, it references that al-Masjid al-Haram. What is it referencing if that building has not been created at that point? It seems like someone's... Personally, I believe that it may have been the people of Mecca at the time who wanted the center to remain the Kaaba for their own purposes. And uh, they've created this building and they've gone, hey, Al Masjid Al Haram, this is what the book was talking about when it never existed at the time of the verse. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, a couple things to unpack there. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that you had mentioned was uh, the Ahruf, mm -hmm. right? All right. So uh, what's your understanding of that? And it's OK if you're starting at like a one out of 10 or like a zero. It's, it's totally fine. So, but no, so, just like on a scale of like one to 10, what's your understanding of that? So understanding is that there was seven different dialects in which the Quran was revealed. Uh, they were according to the seven different tribes or something. Um, the seven different dialects weren't exactly the same. Because according to one of the Hadith, one of the Prophet's uh, disciples is listening to another disciple recite the Quran. And uh, when he says something different to what he was taught, he pulls him aside, goes to the Prophet and says, Hey, you told me this, but you told him this. Which one is it? And for him, it was such a big difference that he had to ask the Prophet. So for me, I have to consider that what was the prophet's response? Go ahead and finish the hadith. Oh, uh, it was basically that um, either one is okay. No, he said you're both correct. Yeah. He didn't say either one's okay. Okay, so now um, here's what happened, right? Mm -hmm. You had, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, I have a little bit of a, a cough. Yeah, so it's it's okay. I'm, I'm the same. I'm going to be muting it. And the same. It, like, <laughs> sometimes it catches up to me. Okay. So you have the Quran being revealed mm. in seven ahruf. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, what these were, were not the actual modices of recitation, but they were dialects of languages. So what happened was when the Quran was first coming down, it was in a Qurayshi dialect. Okay. And now as the emissaries went over to the neighboring tribes mm -hmm. and they started reciting the Quran in order to make it easy for them because there was people that were elderly, there's people that are young, they're trying to memorize, and also their dialects are different. So mm -hmm. sim similar to how like somebody would be speaking in like a Scottish accent compared to like an English accent, they may have words. So like, uh, as I give you an example, I met a guy in, uh, no joke, true story, real life, 
met a guy, his name was Mike. Hmm. And no goes, way. Sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> super, super rare name. Right? <laughs> he goes, he goes, what are you, what are Yoon's doing? And I said, what? And he goes, Yoon's, what are you doing? Hmm. And I was like, uh, what is that? You know? And he's like, oh, well, it's the two of you. Right. So there, I was there with another friend. And in, in the South, Ewan's is a very common phrase to delineate just two people. Mm -hmm. But I've never, I've never heard of it. Mm -hmm. Right. So now on that same token, when uh, the Prophet Sam was reciting, he asked Angel Jibril to increase him, increase mm -hmm. him in knowledge and increase him in revelation. Mm -hmm. And he gave him uh, uh, a, um, a different uh, ahruf. Okay. So now when the emissaries were going over to the neighboring tribes, they would recite in those uh, different ahruf where you have a different, um, not just in an enunciation, but even the word can be entirely different. However, it's not contradictory in meaning, rather it's an enrichment. So like, for example, they'll say, Malik Yomidin, Malik Yomidin, Tabayanu, Tathabatu, right? It's the way, you know, the way that the words are recited would add additional nuancing mm. to the Quran. Okay. Now it was still conceptually understood with, with a hundred percent, right. Understanding of the meaning being exactly the same, rather it was just a form of enrichment. Now further, what happened from there, once those seven ahruf were revealed, then uh, the prophet salam in the Quran, it says that we have made this Quran in Arabic so it's easy for you to, to recite and mm -hmm. easy for you to read, right? So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Now, one of the cool things about that is you have different styles of recitation. So these are called qira'at. Mm -hmm. If you were to start reciting, and let's say you're reciting the, uh, the first uh, ahruf for 10% of it, and then the next 90% you recite in a different ahruf, you now have one unique qira'at, okay? So you have ways of recitation of these seven ahruf. You can do 10% here, 20% here, 30% here, 20% here, 10% here, and now you have a brand new qira'at. So it was qira'at the introduced by Muhammad or was this afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you had also, you, absolutely. He would recite in different ahruf. And no, no, I understand the ahruf, but the ahruf isn't the same as the qira'at, right? No, it's not the same. So yeah. what it is, is the ahruf is a dialect, but the qira'at is a recitation style. Now, these mm -hmm. qira'at can be composed of any type of the ahruf. And what's unique about it is if you were to recite in one style, one dialect, right? And then you were to incorporate another dialect, you would create your own qira'at. Okay? Okay. Now you're still sticking to the seven ahruf that were revealed. But you guys but, don't know all the seven ahruf, right? I'm sorry? You don't know all seven ahruf, right? Because uh, right now you have the one uh, ahruf that you use, which I think is uh, hafs, no, 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 hafs. Uh, you have hafs, you have wars, you have uh, tamin, those are the kira'at, right? You have no, no, these are not kira'at. Okay. Those are no, so so now I'm going to explain the process, right? Mm -hmm. But you have I have to lay the foundation for you first. Mm -hmm. So, first, you have these seven ahruf, mm -hmm. okay? From these seven ahruf, you can just recite one of them, and that would be a type of kira'at, mm -hmm. a recitation. Mm -hmm. Now, if you combined two or three or all seven, that would also be another type of qira'at. Mm. Okay. Now, what happened is when the emissaries would go over to the neighboring tribes and they would recite in their dialect, okay, part of the words would be from the Qurayshi dialect. And then Qureshi. when mm -hmm. it would be, uh, you know, do you see how it's connecting now? So it would be of their, let's say, Tamimi dialect, mm. right? And they would make a combination, okay? So this Tamim tribe would be able to interact with the Quraysh and they would obviously exchange certain dialectical features, mm -hmm. right? It's not like it was like you were speaking Spanish and I was speaking like French and now, mm -hmm. oh man, no, it's all Arabic, but there would be certain things like the word Ewan's and so on, mm -hmm. right? Okay, now 
when they would combine these two dialects, you would get a form of a qira'at. Mm. Okay. From there, you had companions that would jot down within their own mushafs notes. So they would be writing down things, you know, because they wrote things on like bone, parchment, um, they rocks, like leather, uh, whatever was available at the time, mm -hmm. right? Okay, these companions would create their own books and they would have notes within these books, okay? What happened then is after the passing of the Prophet, they uh, Abu Bakr and Uthman basically were at odds on what to do, whether or not to compile the Quran in a in a written text or not, mm -hmm. right? But you had the Battle of Yamana, and from that battle, lots of the Hufaz died. So Omar convinced Abu Bakr that this is the best thing to do, right, in order to preserve it. So what they would do is they would invite two witnesses, two witnesses that heard and saw the Prophet ﷺ receive the revelation to vet the verse that came. And they did that for every section, every verse of the Quran, right? When they compiled it, they compiled it without diacritical marks. <laughs> what that compiling allowed to do was see the various different ahruf, and from those various different ahruf, you can see that people can make their own qira'at because there's no diacritical marks, which is the fatha kasra dhamma, the thing that you see that would in provide enunciations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, after they compiled that, Uthman radiallahu anhu ordered the mushafs of the people that had their own personal notes to be burned in order so that there is no confusion whatsoever. Now you have five clean, they had five originals, masahif, that just had the ahruf in there with no diacritical marks. Later, when that was taken, as emissaries took it in order to collect the masahif from the neighboring tribes and by order burn them, mm. right? The people, started re reciting within their own styles, right? So they had the seven ahruf, and they would recite in their own qira'at from those seven ahrufs. Everything's all standardized now. So Okay. Sorry, just to clarify. So you're saying that the seven ahruf remained in the one Quran? Uh, I'm saying, yes, the possibility for all seven ahruf remained in there because there was no diacritical marks, but period. It's possible. So you're saying the possibility remains in there, but it's not something we know for sure, right? No, no, no. We know for sure that it remained in there. What I'm trying to tell you is the possibility of all seven remained, not the possibility of it existing or the possibility of it being accurate. It's all there. It's all existing. But because there's no diacritical marks, someone can say Maliki Yomiddin and someone can say Maliki Yomiddin. They're yeah, the but both options exist but, there's no marks so if there was seven different ways can you uh -huh. give because I, I typically hear this example maliki omadine and um, the other one yeah, Malik. Uh -huh. can you give me seven different ways of saying that just so i understand exactly what you're talking about or what that word would mean in those seven different ways yeah, so i don't i don't know the seven recitation styles by heart but okay. what I do know is that if you were to look up, there's plenty of videos out there and you can see the seven styles. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now there's, there's, there's many styles. So I'll explain the process that took place. I know there's 10 now, but yeah, there's 10, right? There should only um, be seven. And that's what confuses me. It's like, yes. And there is a reason why that confusion stemmed out. And it's because there was a, a gentleman, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now, but I can get it for you. Mm -hmm. And basically what he did was he wrote a book about the seven recitation styles mm -hmm. and he called them kira'at, uh, the kira'at. Mm -hmm. And because he observed these seven recitation styles, now it reflected back on the seven ahruf. And that's where the confusion between the Qur'at and the Ahruf started happening. So what the scholarship did was they added three more styles and they composed a new book 
uh, to show the 10 different styles of recitation in order to eliminate that confusion. Because, but, uh -huh. sorry, that, that doesn't that go against, because if God wanted it to be 10, he would have sent uh, Gabriel with 10 different. He sent it in seven. So adding more is like. No, that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to lay that. So remember the foundation that I laid. The laid foundation is the seven ahruf. Yeah. Okay. From those seven ahruf, you can have 30, 50, 60 different ad styles, 70, 80. It doesn't matter. Because if somebody were to take mix, 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 yeah. Of, yes, yeah, and now you you make your own concoction of the recitation style. So, for example, you might see someone say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Hamdulillah Rabbil Alamin, Rahman Rahim, Malik Yom Din. Okay, like as an example, then you have another person that says Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alamin, and then they speed it up somewhere else as an example. Okay, so even different. the speed. Would end up no, I'm, I'm just okay. simplifying it for you. I'm okay, just cool, I'm cool, cool, cool. giving it down to the absolute base, 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 just so you can understand that a person can mix and match recitation styles based on using these seven ahruf. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, all, all good? <laughs> a little okay. bit, but no, it's just the fact that I, I get the kira'at. I get the kira'at could be multiple ways. Mm -hmm. But um, there should only be like seven aharuf, um if there was there are, more, only there are only seven. Okay, so there's not ten. Um, those three extra are kira kira'at. Correct. Right. So what you're dealing okay. with, so that's, that's what I'm trying to give it to you yeah. piece by piece. What you're dealing with is seven aharuf. Yeah. Then there was a, a, a gentleman that made a book called the Seven Kira'at. Mm -hmm. But it's not kira'at, it's actually aharuf. No, hold on. It, he was talking about the seven kara'at that he observed. And this is where your confusion is. You're, you are melding the kara'at and the ahruf. And then scholarship included three more kara'at as an example to show that you can have more kara'at than there are ahruf. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So now, uh, and there's a beautiful video that I'll link you that explains all this in greater detail, but I'm just cool. for the sake of conversation. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, and, and, and it provides you with references from Bukhari and it provides you with, with the names of all the Qur'at and it provides you with the historic record of who crafted the book and what, you know, and, and all this stuff. Right. Okay. So now from there, okay. You had the best reciters the best reciters within each uh, um, out of. Like, tribe, oh, okay? Yeah, so, yeah so it would be out of. Yeah, yeah, the best reciters of that kira'at, okay? Because remember, the, the Uthmani text does not have diacritical marks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the Quran that we have today, right? The Uthmani Quran, when those reciters with their tajweed and their eloquence and all that other stuff now sorry what's the, tajweed the tajweed is like certain enunciation and oh, pausation oh, 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 oh. and like oh, oh. El elongation and their accent and all that other stuff right okay yeah. so now what Uthman did was they added the diacritical marks and said in order to avoid any confusion Right. We have now even standardized the enunciation based on the best reciters. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? The meaning still stays the same. The words are all there. Right. However, you have people today that still recite based on the seven ahruf because we uh, believe that the Quran is a oratory tradition. Mm -hmm. so even though that the writing is there to make it easy for someone like you and me to provide a reference, meaning we would be mimicking the best reciters at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have the freedom of reciting in any one of those ahruf and composing your own kira'at. Mm -hmm. Right. So the thing that you're seeing as it being burned or some type of corruption or something like that, that didn't happen. Uh, right. 
it, no, it's for me, like I said, the fact that it's not in seven different ways where it could have been, and it's all been standardized into one is like saying that, oh, this is the way God should have done it. And even though God said, no, it could be read in seven different ways, we've decided, no, it's better if we do it this way. So that's why I'm like, it's technically a corruption because it's not in the way that it was presented to you guys. Um, not that it's completely changed or anything, but like you said, with the Maliki Umadin and the Maliki whatever, one means the king of the day of judgment and one means the master of the day of judgment or something okay. like that. Uh, so even, yes, the whole essence of the verse still remains as to what it means, but the words used, uh, or the way it said, changes the word that is used. And like I said, that's why I believe that it was standardized is because then the words that were then used were more in line with the people in charge and what they wanted to get out of it. Right. So again, you're, you're making a fundamental error and mm -hmm. the error is first, you believe that God didn't reveal it in seven ways, right? No, no, I'm, no, I'm saying that, uh, I'm, I'm going with your beliefs. I, I what I believe doesn't matter. So well, you guys believe that in seven different ways. You're trying to build a bridge, right? So you, you have to understand that a lost path out that revealed it in seven ways. Yeah. Okay. And then the re he also said it revealed it in a way where you can have your own recitation style as a yeah, copy. The Arthur, yeah. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. I've got no right. issue with the out. It's just the seven hour roof. Right. So so now what you have to what you have to understand is that there is no corruption in the fact that there are seven different methods, so seven different ahruf that you can recite. And if you recite them, combining those in any way, shape, or form, it does not take away from the Qur'an at all, nor does it create a contradiction within itself. Rather, what it does is enrich and create nuancing. I'm sorry to disagree. Uh, I don't want to be one of those guys, but it's just because you don't have the seven out of separately to you make do. that claim. Oh, you've, you, got, you've got all seven different out of. Yes. So not, not, with, not, not within the one text. I understand you said that it was combined into one text. I'm saying, yes. Do you have, you have all seven separate? Qureshi dialect. Yes, Sorry? you have. Yes, you have seven ahruf. And remember, it's an oratory tradition. Mm. I'm giving you the process as to what was taken from, mm. from way back when to its standardization today. But what we have as a historical reference, and you have ijazas in the Quran which are certificates of authenticity that of chains of teachers that yeah. go back to the Prophet. If you were to want to get an ijaza in a particular type of ahruf, go for it. So uh, if you could, uh, so you said one was Qureshi and what was another version of the... Yeah, just just Google them up. You have a Tamim, you have a Qureshi, you have Hafs, you have... Um, uh, there's a, a, the, I mean, just Google it up. It'll, it'll be readily available. For me, it was uh, because I'm not going to be studying the seven different ahrufs. I don't mm. need to know how to recite all seven. You know what I'm saying? That's no, not an obligation for, for you to be a Muslim. For, no, for, just for me, because personally, I would like yeah, to see... You know, all the information that I have is available readily to you too, man. Just, yeah. just do a little bit of digging. You it's just because I mean? uh, I've tried to look for the seven different... Um, no. Yeah, can I... <laughs> Aruf, sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. uh, I've tried to look for them and I couldn't find them. It was just one standardized <laughs> Quran. Uh, here. Quraysh. Oh, Takif. T H A K. Right. That's, thank you very much, Elias. Oh, this is Elias. <laughs> he was uh, abusing me on my channel. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He came he came over here <laughs> and he was actually really helpful thank you see i know you could be a good guy elias i knew it uh cool that's awesome yeah so i'll look into that so because i just want to see what the difference is like you said um uh, yeah oh, i forgot already what you said but the omadeen and the other one you, right. you one is king of the day of judgment one is the master of the judgment day of judgment i want to be able to look at all the different 
Qurans yep. and look at the different sure. words that will potentially. It. I totally encourage it. Now, remember, when you look at that, right, mm. side by side with that, I would recommend that you pair it with a scholar, scholarly understanding. That way that they can take you back in time to show you what the thought process was. Because remember, as an oratory tradition, like chest to chest, right, this is the, the main modus of preservation and the main modus of explanation, mm. right? So what I was trying to do is I was trying to get you to today's time in hopes to show you the step-by-step -step process. But in doing so, I want you to know that historically everything is available to you. It's just more so to get you current, right? It wasn't to deviate from the, from the, uh, um, you know, root question of mm. there being corruptions from time to time and, and this, that, and the third, which there are not any. It's more so just so you understand how we got to the present day and where typically somebody might think that there was a fall off or some type of an infusion of either man-made stuff or something like that. Yeah, well, th th this is one way I can have a look at that is if I yeah. can see the seven different Nairo, if I could go, yeah. boom, okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so part of that question was also the, um, I added the idea that uh, the Kaaba wasn't really a yeah. direction of prayer and the only thing that the Al-Masjid Al-Haram was referenced to did not exist at the time. Yeah, so if you actually look, uh, I recommend you look up Tafsir as Sadi, and uh, the Kaaba did exist at the time. No, no, I know the Kaaba did, but the uh, yeah. Masjid al Haram didn't. Masjid al Haram is a saint. So, are, are you familiar with what Haram means? Uh, holy, holy place. Yeah, a sanctuary. Yeah. Right. Okay. So now, um, you had, uh, especially in Surah Al Isra, which is the night journey. Ah, the night journey. That's the one. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. So in that, if you were to look up Tafsir al Sadi, you can find his Tafsir online. He'll tell you specifically that there was a, uh, a, a majority opinion that the Prophet ﷺ left from one of the houses that was there rather than him actually leaving from the Kaaba, right? Mm -hmm. So from Masjid al-Haram to Bayt al-Maqdis in Jerusalem. Yeah, but Masjid is a mosque, right? It, well, so it is a, when you say a mosque, if you're thinking of like a modern day mosque, right? It's the it's the wrong thought process to have. Like the Prophet Sam's mosque, like didn't even have a roof at one point. You know, it was no. Like, I, can, I, I can understand yeah, that, but the the idea of the mosque is a place of prayer, correct? It's a dedicated. It's a it's a house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So a dedicated place of prayer, for like almost like a, a house of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. But um. This was see, this is where I'm confused because he prayed at the Kaab. No, he spoke at the Kaaba. Where did he pray? Did he have a particular house that he prayed in? No, or was it just his house? No, 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 no. So the whole area around the, the, that whole area, like I don't know if you, if you were to just to pull up a picture of Mecca right now, right? Mm -hmm. You'll see Masjid Haram, and mm -hmm. you'll see the the surrounding area. You'll see hotels that are in Masjid Haram. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because the area keeps expanding and the masjid keeps expanding, then the sanctified grounds are also expanding. So much so to the point now that if you're basically praying in the hotel, you're in the haram. So when if the Prophet was praying around the Kaaba, so let's say, for example, he was 200 feet from it, mm -hmm. right? It would be considered masjid al haram because it's an open air masjid. It's not like it, it has to have like these criteria of like four walls and like, so look, even today, there's no roof over the Kaaba, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, you have a, a, a decorated place and you have s certain segments that are like tiered, right? And mm -hmm. you can be either at like the first floor or second floor, but on the same token, because there's so many people that come now, right? And I've been there many times when they issue the event, the call to prayer, you'll literally see people praying out on the streets. And because they are in uh, Jama'ah, they are in the rows, they're in the safs, uh, they are considered to be praying at Masjid al -Hal. Okay, so Muhammad uh, during the night journey was at 
the Kaaba in a particular area where he was praying when he had the night no, journey? He was at a house. Um, here, oh. hold on. I will. I'll try to locate it for you really quickly. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, with me, just a moment. 